Brad, Brad Donnelly. Brad Donnelly. Back again. Back Yay. again. The first the first guest that we've had on as a repeat guest. Yes. That's cool. That it quick is. within a month too. Wow. Well. You hey. must be chock full of knowledge and we got some good stuff to talk about well, today. I think the last time we actually like we all spoke, like we've learned a little like Brad was like, we could talk there's so much more we could talk about. Yeah. And we got really into the depth of like a lot of things, but today we're gonna try to make things a little bit more simple yep. and uh Break it down a little bit. So it's just full of knowledge over there, just itching to get it out. So <laughs> let's go. So 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 the way that we're gonna go about this today is we're gonna go um, from the beginning of the buying process to the end from your point of view, from yeah. your financial broker point of view to getting the mortgage to getting approved. And as we go through that, so the goal for anybody watching will be that they have a better understanding of the process of the entire process from start to finish. And then as we go through this, we're going to go off on little tangents yep. on things like credit score, down payments, and then, but we're going to do the full circle and bring it right back to um, the, the buying process. and end with the uh, pretty well somebody getting the mortgage and getting everything sorted out from there. So I think um, without further ado, this, this will help a lot of people because if everyone does what we're going to talk about, it makes life easier for everyone, right? Everyone, you, me, everybody. Yeah. So let's go. So let's say somebody's coming in, Brad, the first thing that they're coming to you, they say, I want to, I want to get pre-approved. That's the first step that people should be looking to to pursue in the home buying journey. So somebody comes to you, Brad, and they say, I'm looking to get pre-approved. What's your steps at that point? So when we're doing a pre-approval, we're basically pre-underwriting the file. So we need to get as much information as possible up front. So we're trying to gather as much as we can. So when a client calls or we have a meeting, the first thing we're going to ask for is, all the information about your income i'll break that down your debt and your history so if you go through an application process like we have a software package like everybody else does and the first thing we're going to look for is we're going to you know who what's your name what's your address what's your three-year history of your address because again lenders require all of this because any file could be audited by ofsi so we have to, which is the Office of Superintendent of Insurances, so, uh, which is a part of the federal government. So at the end of the day, we have to kind of gather as much information. So we're really kind of honing in on, okay, so where have you lived for the last three years? Give, us, give me the last three years of your uh, job history or your income history. You might be retired, you might be getting CPP and OAS, or you might be working, or you may have changed jobs. So we want to get a, a good grasp of what your income is, where it's coming from, who's on it. Are you receiving child tax benefit? That's income money we can use. Are you receiving uh, maybe investment dividends? That's money we can use. Um, obviously your paycheck or if you're seasonal, maybe you're a fisherman or you're working in the woods and you're seasonal every year for the last two years, you've gotten T4s and you've gotten EI. That's fine. Like for seasonal workers, is there certain banks that won't touch that? I think most banks, most brokers will use seasonal as long as it's two years or more. So it's much like okay, being okay. self-employed. If you're self-employed, you we want to see two kind years. Of thing, we want to see the pattern. Right. Yeah. Okay. So we're looking for your income. Then in the conversation, we talk about your debt, and we get a rough idea of what your debt is. Like, what are you carrying for credit cards? What's your car payment? That's a killer always because mm -hmm. large car payment means you're using up a lot of your income for car. Um, so what you know, credit cards, car payment, student loan, those type of things. Um, so that's the income, the debt, and then we will send you documents for you to sign so that we can pull your credit to confirm, you know, on the credit report, what you said is real. Is, is that being reported properly on the credit report? Because the lender is going to look at a credit report. Right. We'll also ask the client to send us all their income documents. So we're looking for two years T4s. We're looking for your notice of assessment, child tax benefit if you have it. And if you're retired, your CPP statement or your old age security statement. The reason we ask for the T4s is to confirm what you're bringing in for income and what you have brought in for income in the last two years. We'll also ask for eventually, not upfront, but eventually a letter of employment. 
and in some cases your letter of employment is either going to be better or worse than your T4. So for example, if you're working at Southern New Brunswick Railway yeah. and your base salary is 75000 a year, but you work a ton of overtime, we as brokers can opt to use your two years T4s with your overtime as opposed to your letter that says you only make seventy five. Okay. So if you worked overtime and you made ninety eight or a hundred thousand dollars a year, and then the second year you brought in a hundred and one or a hundred and two, we'll use the two year average as opposed to your job letter, which gives you an opportunity to get more house. Okay. So that's why we ask for T fours. Why do we ask for notice of assessments? We want to know that you don't owe the tax man any money. Because little known fact, the tax man takes first payer status on any house. So if your house went into receivership or default, lender's not going to get the house first. Canada Revenue is going to put a lien on the house first. Okay. Yeah. So the government always <laughs> wins in that situation. How, how um, recent do the taxes have to be paid for anybody like out there, let's say, if they owe some back taxes or if they're, if they're behind a few years? What is a... Like, do all taxes have to be paid up to date in order to get approved for a mortgage? Yes. Okay. Short, that's short answer is yes. Now, okay. if you have a tax, say you did your notice of assessment last year and you owed $1,200, we would ask the client to pay the CRA debt, the $1,200, and give us a statement showing they have a zero balance before the house closes. Not at time of application, but before the house closes. So okay. it gives the client time to kind of pay that off. Right. Okay. So if you would like... Whatever. Say you owed a little bit. Uh, could you use your... Say you're taking money at RSPs or something like that for mm -hmm. your down payment. Could you... Say the down payment was 18000 but you had 30000 RSPs because I think you can take out up to 30000 35. 35000 So yeah. could you use that RSP money extra to pay off any taxes owing? I th that is going to be dependent on the lender. Some okay. lenders will allow you to do it. Some lenders probably won't. It's always safe to say if you're going to pay off Canada revenue debt, I know most of our what we call A lenders or top of the line lenders will probably say no. It should come out of your own account. The RSP is intended, the first time home buyer's plan is intended for um, down payment, closing costs, moving costs, whatever you think is necessary to withdraw from your RSP to, to enable you to get your house. Okay. Right. That's that's the intent. So how you shuffle your money is really up to you. But at the end of the day, if you're going to take $20,000 out to cover your down payment, your closing costs, the cost of your move, how maybe do, cost of a hotel while you're waiting to move in, you know, that type of thing. How do you, like, for people that, like, I have clients now, they have, like, say, credit card debt and this, like, how do you recommend, like, how, how do people save for a down payment today with all... The world is so expensive like to live it's, here. Like, How tough. do people, how do you recommend any tips? To, well, I mean, the, the like, hardest thing like, to, to gather is the down payment. So the minimum down payment on a single family home is 5%. So how do you get that? Well, you can take it, you, you most, um, but most people that are working nine to five in an office will have an RSP plan with their office. If your company offers you that RSP plan, take it because they're taking the money out of you before taxes. So that money's sitting there, it's not taxed, right? That yeah. RSP money is sitting there. Right. And you can take it out through the first time home buyers program through the RSP. Tax free. Tax free as long as you repay it over fifteen years. Right. So there's that. Repay that's one what? Option. The taxes or the money you borrowed? It's like you, you have to the, put the RSP back in there kind yeah, of deal. So right? if you took twenty thousand dollars out of your RSP tax free and you used it, you have to repay that twenty thousand dollars over fifteen years through your regular annual tax return. So your accountant just kind of takes. Yeah, it. yeah. Basically, they just take one fifteenth and they add it to your tax uh, taxable income. And the way to to counteract that so you don't lose any money at tax time is just to have your employer take an extra twenty dollars out of your paycheck every two weeks. That way, okay. it'll okay. be like nothing ever happened. That's so, smart. so it's all tax free. It's all interest free. So the RSP plan is a great plan. As long as you understand that you've got to pay it back. Now, there's a second option, which is if you'd want to open up an FHSA, which is a first time homebuyer savings account, which is new as of last year. So that enables you to say it's like a savings account. Any bank will open it up for you. It's a savings account. So you can take maybe $100 a week and throw it in there, or $100 a month, whatever you can afford, and throw it into your FHSA. So the first time homebuyer savings plan is basically it's a bank account that allows you to withdraw the money from the FHSA for your down payment. 
Is there interest in that account? Like, can you accumulate interest? On it your does. Account? Yeah, you can accumulate interest in the FHSA. It's a small. It's a bank, so you're not going to make a lot of interest on right. it. Right. But at the end of the day, you can take that money out and apply it to your down payment, and then next year, that's a taxable benefit. That eight thousand dollars you're allowed to put in your FHSA every year is an eight thousand dollar credit on your tax return next year. Wow. So it's a huge. If you don't use it. No, if you use it, like oh. if you withdraw, if you've opened up an account and you have the, the amount of money you have in that FHSA, as soon as you withdraw it, it triggers a tax benefit for next year. You'll now, get a receipt. Now that money that you have in the F, in the FHSA that already has been taxed, though, right? That's already taxed money. That's already yeah. That's after tax money, right? After tax because money. you're contributing from your income. Oh, right. So, it's, okay. right. so so you've already you've already paid been. income tax on yeah. it, and then you put that into an account, yeah. and then there's a taxable. There's no tax involved. No? Okay. But no. so the credit that you're talking about. I'm just the, trying to wrap my head around that. The credit, that. yeah. It's a it's it it creates a credit. It creates the credit. It okay. creates a credit okay. on your next year's tax return. So it's like eight thousand dollars of income you didn't receive then. That's right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Cool. And cool. there's no ninety day limit. You don't you can open it tomorrow and take it out on Tuesday. And as long as that money if you if you transferred it from your checking account into your FHSA today and then you, five days later you decided to withdraw that money. Yeah, there's no no prerequisite to keep it in an account. Now, for do you days. have to use that for? Say something comes up, you just don't end up buying a house, and you're saving in that for two years. Do you, can you take it anyway, or do you have to use it for a house? No, you can take it out. You just you, you just won't, access to you it just won't get the credit for it. Right. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. Um, so in that, so th that there is kind of the opening statement of the first steps somebody should take. When mm -hmm. they're looking to get into purchasing a home. So we just talked about kind of like the pre-approval process. But yeah. in there, there was a whole bunch of things that I wanted to unpack as well. Because we were talking about um, like credit score and making sure that you have your down payment and everything along those lines. Yeah. So I think it'd be a good idea to maybe steer this in the direction of, for people watching, what's considered good credit? What do you look at as good credit? What's the minimum credit you could have to, right. to even like, get considered to buy a house? Well, Thank you. two years credit, two lines of credit. So it's either two credit cards or a credit card and a car loan or a credit card and a line of credit. Two credit lines for two years. That's kind of the minimum. Two credit, I don't two credit lines for two years? Yeah. What do you mean? So when we say credit line, a credit line or a credit line can be a credit card, can be a line of credit. Oh, I see. Can be a car payment, yeah. can be a loan. So two units of credit for two years. Go. In good standing. In good standing. Now, with, right. So what's yeah. considered good standing? Like payment, what are we looking at? Payments made on time. Payments made on time, always. Always. Let's now, say there was one month for some reason. If you have a reason and it's one month, you have a reason and maybe it's two months over 24 months, then usually the lenders will be okay with it. Okay. But you've got to have a good reason because we have to explain that to the lender. Right. Right. Well, you know what? Something that threw me off when I was um, first learning about kind of like credit cards and stuff like that is the payments. So I used to set my credit cards up on renewed payments at a certain date every month. I was like on the... 27th for whatever reason like mm -hmm. let's just i'm just throwing a number out there but i always was like on the 27th i'm going to pay the card and that way i'm paying it monthly what i didn't realize is that these credit card cycles move so their monthly payments are due at different times each month it's like every what Why? like 20 really? 20 you... some days yeah i didn't know that because because i started to fall out of cycle and then i was getting calls saying you're late on your payments and i'm like i pay at I the just... same time every single month and they're like well right if you do that you'll eventually fall out of cycle and i was just like they make this really challenging. They make this really, I did not and then know I just that. put everything on auto, on auto pay on my, on my, um, oh, on my can, online banking. I put it all that? on. Yeah, you auto can just pay put for it, a credit card. Yeah, you have it on like the minimum payment at least comes out, so that if you're paying at the wrong time, then you don't get any okay. negative hits on your credit card. Yeah. But um, so that was kind of like one piece of advice that the bank gave me, but um, but they do make that fairly fairly tricky. So that's the reason I was asking about that too, because like. Yeah, sometimes it, it will happen. Sometimes on, yeah. something will happen, and you'll you, it'll fall through the cracks. What is the minimum score? Like Brandon was saying, there. What like what? I don't even know. Is it like is it six hundred or seven hundred? Like what do you? Every need? bank, every lender is different. Every broker. Like I'm broker talking lender. a good lender, not be like like for if you're. If I were to say to get every, the best interest yeah, rate, kind yes. of deal to get the best interest <laughs> rates. Well, it's not that that's the most not, favorable. You will get. You will always get the same interest rate as long as you meet the minimum beacon score, the minimum credit score, which right. is which is on exactly. average, because it's different from every lender. We we deal with thirty two different lenders, right? Right. So it's yes. different for every lender. Okay. They range from six ten to six sixty. 
I'd say if you have a six ten to six sixty as a minimum. So okay. I would say six fifty. If you have a six fifty beacon score, that's what you need to have. A beacon score is a credit score. Yeah. Like the way they they have it set up, though, I don't like. If you get your credit score checked, that drops your credit. So yeah. let's. It's let's, so <laughs> foolish. <laughs> like what? Sorry, I right. checked my credit score. So the more you down. Okay. Well, that's the difference between. And I'm not super familiar, but there's soft credit checks and hard credit checks, right? So let's talk a little bit about that. So let's your, talk on it. Your, cre- <laughs> your credit it. check is a, a check of your credit history, your your credit capability, your utilization of how much of your credit you're using. A hard hit is when a lender, you have to have a hard hit done whenever you're borrowing a vehicle or buying a vehicle, mm-hmm. whether you're leasing a vehicle, whether you're purchasing a property, that's called a hard hit. And yes, your score does go down for 30 days. It will bounce back. So keep that in mind. It Wonder will why, bounce why, back. Why, though? The reason is simply that if you have somebody that's out there searching or what we call troll in the industry, trolling for credit, mm-hmm. going to every lender. So I have had clients that have gone to five different banks and brokers. Five, five hard hits. Boom, oh, boom, boom, boom. So their knowing. score has gone from 700 to 620. Yeah. Oh. Because they're trolling for credit. They're looking not for credit. Not knowing, probably. Probably not knowing because maybe their banker or broker didn't tell them, which is the first thing we tell people. We don't hit your credit until we really believe that you're going to buy a house. Right. So at the end of the day, we hit their credit. So there's a little known fact about brokers is that brokers will hit your credit once. Okay. okay. The banks will then do a soft hit to confirm your credit report. Uh, okay. So... You might see on your credit report, uh, Brad Donnelly Mortgages or Premier Mortgage Center, hard hit. And then you might see TD, Scotia, First National, Manulife on there. Those are all soft hits. They don't affect your credit. They don't affect it? Don't affect it at all. Okay, but you'll see multiple banks trying? You'll see it, but it'll be coded as a soft hit. So with the soft hit, can you tell like, okay, this person's going to be good? Or like sometimes... Like, can you really get into the like the nitty gritty? Oh yeah, of we get, their stuff with a soft credit. Does that make sense? With a soft hit, yeah, it, you'll get the same information, but it won't be as detailed. Okay. A hard hit will give you the complete entire credit history of a client. Okay, so there is different information pulled on either of these hits. Yeah. So a soft hit is less information than a hard hit. Uh, yeah. That's interesting. I didn't. So know. a hard hit, we do the hard hit. The bank just does a soft hit to confirm that the credit report we pulled is authentic. So you okay. do is, so okay because you're dealing with the bank. So you do a soft I, hit before you actually. No, he does send the hard it. hit. I do a hard hit first. He does the hard and then, hit, and oh, then okay. and then whatever bank he sends people to, it sounds like they confirm it with oh, a soft hit t- on okay, their end. Gotcha. Now, what I'm not okay. sure of on what you said there, Brad, yeah. and I'd just like to break it down a little bit. So you mentioned multiple banks yeah. saying that Scotia, TD, RBC will all do soft hits. Are they all doing that, or is it just one bank normally checking that you're... So if I are take... Are you normally if, checking on multiple banks, or is there only one bank normally doing the soft hit? Well, it depends on the client, too. Okay. So the client may say, well, we want to work with First National. So... We will send the application to First National. They will do a soft hit on it. Um, or like a client that we dealt with before where the First National didn't have the appetite for the client. They felt that the client you know, wasn't uh, to their liking. So we had to take it to another lender. And so that second lender did another soft hit. Okay. And that client is now closing their house very soon. Okay. So then... So to wrap that portion up, so we said um, the credit score needs to be around, you said between 610 and 650 is a minimum? Minimum. I would say if you are out house hunting in this economic time, yes, 650 should be your best. Okay. okay. Or Fair. more. Or more. Okay. And that right. goes That's what six... most of people are going to want to know. Yeah. That's right. it. Forget the rest. Now, What's my credit score going to be? Right. If you're right. a secondary person on an application, so if it's a husband and wife and the husband is the breadwinner, yeah. his minimum credit really should be 650 or more. Okay. And if it's 650, it just basically means that they haven't had a lot of time to build credit or they had stumbled in the past, usually. The average credit score from the average client that we see come across our desk is a 680 or above. Okay. Now, yes, we do get outliers. We get you know secondary uh, people that might have gone through a bankruptcy seven or eight years ago, might have had some issues, maybe they're separated, that type yeah. of thing. But to go back to the second person on the application, so if if Evan has a 680 beacon score and Evan's spouse has a 620 beacon score, 
because Evan is the breadwinner in the situation, that secondary person, we can still use their income. It's not going to hurt the deal as long as it's over, say, 620, 630. So if the primary breadwinner has higher... Has to have a higher so score. So sometimes score, it's not where it, vice versa. Like if my if my wife, Brandon's girlfriend, had a better credit score than us, say, and ours was in the best, sometimes it might be better for either of us not to even be on it. In too. cases, there are some cases where it's better to not have a spouse on it. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And okay. usually the breadwinner is the one with the lowest credit score because they're using up the most amount of credit. They're the ones that are... The breadwinners are usually the ones that that are, you know, getting the credit cards on the line of credits to be able to, you know, facilitate living in a rental property or in a house that they're living in right now. Right. It's a secondary person who may have a part-time job or may have a smaller job or, or a job that may not make as much as the breadwinner that is going to have a higher credit score because they're not utilizing the credit. So right. it's, it's kind of a catch. So then in that situation, you'd almost, do you need the breadwinner involved in purchasing and getting on the mortgage because they make the majority of the money even though the spouse has the better credit score like in that situation what would you recommend do do both of them probably need to be on it i would tell you this everybody's situation is as unique as your dna right yeah. so there are things and there are little things in your credit that we have to look out for and little things in your spouse's credit that we have to look out for and it really depends on the dynamic how long have you been married? Do you have kids? Are you separating? Are you divorced? Are you, you know, Holy so everybody's situation, man. how long have you been working there? Did you change jobs recently? And let me ask yeah. you this, yeah. this, this. You must have ran, like, say there's a couple that have been together for a while. Okay. And then you go to do the credit score. You must have to have some pretty awkward conversations sometimes. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. If you know what I mean? Like, so we, like there's we, some secrets that people... Right. Gonna bring up that don't even know what's going. On. Like, why well, is this? What do you got? Like, and this is why I say you should use a broker. Yeah, a broker is a licensed authority, a, a licensed a financial uh, officer, marriage so, counselor. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> so are we. So we are licensed. <laughs> we are licensed through FCNB. So we we have a fiduciary duty, much like talking right. to a doctor or a lawyer. Yes. Same with any us, yeah. any conversation that you as a client have with me is absolutely one hundred percent protected by law. Right. It cannot right. be shared with anybody, including the lender, okay. unless it's required to get the application through. Right. We will only we do have clients that send us a hundred pages of documents. We will only send the documents that the lender requires to close the deal. Smart, yeah, that makes sense. And we do have situations that are very, very challenging. The worst thing is to call a client on a Friday afternoon and say, "I'm sorry, your credit's not where it should be. We cannot buy. We cannot, you know, finance a house." That's the worst, absolute worst part of our job. Right. Yeah. The best part of our job is telling that young couple that, that they're approved, that they've got their first house. Of course. You know, and yeah. then you have those conversations with couples that are, say, separating. So we have a situation where I'm dealing with the wife, and he, uh, my business partner, is dealing with the husband. So we have to keep that separate too. Right. Right. So I can't talk to my business partner about that part of it, and he can't talk to me about her part of it. So we have to have those difficult discussions individually. Yeah, that could get so, awkward. So yep. in in that um, process, we're still at the pre-approval process, really. Yep. yep. So the um, so we talked about the credit score, what's required. Let's touch on um, income at this point. So okay. one thing that we wanted to touch on here is what is considered income, and I know you you kind of grazed over it, but let's kind of go into the depths of that. What can people use as income, and what's 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 something that you guys qualify? Um, as income, and I know that it, it it'll be different at certain banks that you go to too, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. A little bit, yeah. So there's, I mean, every if it's an insured deal, in other words, if you have CMHC insurance, if it's an uninsured deal, there's always two different versions of everything. Okay. So let's assume somebody's buying a house, and then let's talk about the different types of income. If you're full time, great. You are either paid a salary or you're paid an hourly wage. If you're full time and you're getting paid a salary. We can either use the salary or your T4 income for the last two years, whichever is more. Right. If you're hourly, we can we have to, because you're paid hourly, use the two-year average of your T4s. Okay. What if this... So, okay. There's... Say you're a waiter, bartender, whatever. Mm -hmm. They actually make pretty good money. They have to claim a certain percentage of their tips, correct? Yep. Yep. So what if, can you, like, they make, say, 15 bucks an hour, but they make 
really like 30 bucks an hour with tips whatever's claimed over two years can you guys use that for yes. a bartender or waiter just like yes. i don't know why i just thought of that because whatever's a, claimed right yes like, yeah whatever claimed. claimed so the so, more tips they like anyway the more yeah. tips they claim the better actually they are for because usually they're pretty consistent with what they make on a weekend or right at, uh, so right. if you're a bar if you're a waiter or a bartender you're making x amount of dollars you're getting a t4 from your employer at the end of the year that's your income but on your tax return, you're, you're claiming tips. So your notice of assessment is going to be different because you've claimed everything on your notice of on your taxes. So that records is you can right. show your NOA to you. And NOA show and that. your tax return. You'll need to send me your tax return for the last two years okay. so we can show you know where that money came from. Okay. Yeah. Right. So if you're declaring fifty thousand dollars as a waiter or a bartender, we need to know where that money came from. Right. So we will need a copy of your tax return for the last two years. Right. So okay. that's another. You know, that's another caveat to the in income portion. Because I know there's a lot of bartenders, waiters that make really good money, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Right? Like, Absolutely, like, yeah. Really good. And most of it comes from the tips. Right. Well, right? that's right. Yeah, that's yeah. what they're there. It, yeah. So that's, and then that's, there's the catch-22 of claiming. Claimings. Of claiming all of it. And yeah. then you pay the taxes on it, but it's really good. See, that's the thing, too, with, like, business owners as well, too, right? Um, and that's something I wanted to kind of claim it. get into when it comes to income is like business owners and people like, I mean, similar to us, right? Like running our own business. So self-employed, self-employed income and, and I am self-employed, you are self-employed, right? So right. commissionable income. So again, it depends if you're incorporated or you're not incorporated. What do we require, right? Yeah. So definitely it's a minimum two-year history. So that's two years of tax returns. So we're looking at from a, from a self-employed person, we'd be looking for, if you are purely self-employed, you're not an employee of your brokerage, we're looking at two years T1 tax returns. We're looking at two years notice of assessments. And that's basically it. And they may ask for like, you know, a history of your, uh, your closings. Right. So like, I think this day and age, it's another cat. It's all good. Um, um, this day and age, a lot of people are, I think, the younger generation are starting to maybe go towards entrepreneurship a little bit more, work for themselves. I just think times are changing a little bit. So let me, let me ask this. You might not know the answer. I'm not sure. But if I'm like me and Brandon, we've been incorporated just over two years now, right? Mm -hmm. um, can... Like, when can we start buying stuff with the company? It's two years type thing? Or for anyone out there that's listening that has, they should get incorporated if they're not, if they're working for themselves type thing. Is that a question or a yeah. statement? I'm, I'm, <laughs> question. Should they? I read. There is a certain point when it's it's better. I was it's, trying to ask something there, but I couldn't really put it yeah. in the words. There is, I don't even know, but do you know what? Like, yeah, there's a certain amount of income you should be making in order to be incorporated. In other words, if you, you're a sole proprietor, yes. like say you're mowing lawns for two years and that's your company, you're mowing lawns in the summer, mm -hmm. snow blowing in the winter, whatever, like if you don't incorporate, then you really don't have a job type thing, right? You're not working for anybody. It doesn't Is matter. That, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. <laughs> like you're talking about sole proprietor? Yeah. Like doesn't matter for people to... Well, that, I know, like, if, if that's I think, what your job is, and you're declaring, declaring the money, if that's what your job is, and you're declaring the money, you don't have to be incorporated. You're good. Yes, as long you as you're declaring it, a, right? And I think what you're saying is it can be easier for banks to look at you when you're incorporated and paying yourself as an employee in your company. That's what I'm. Yes. That's what you're kind of trying, trying, yeah, alluding was, to, right? Is like, it pretty well saying? No. Is it not? So I, I always was under the impression that it's it's better if you have a corporation, pay yourself regularly, let's say every two weeks from your company, so that you have more, let's call it, of a stable income that the banks like to see, as opposed to just running your sole proprietor, I think like Evan's talking about, and just kind of making chunks of money here and there. I know that, or I feel at least, that banks would rather see a steady income as from a company from a company you being a corporation paying yourself as a um, employee in that company with a stable income as opposed to just chunks coming here or there let's say both those situations you net out the same at the end of the year is there a preference on how the bank looks at that okay so you're asking? Yes, yes all right thank you you're so welcome. i don't know i just couldn't get so, that out <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, yeah yeah no so I, to clarify i, I can't yeah. speak for bricks and mortar banks okay. i can speak for the broker channel so yes we do represent td we do represent scotia um, and in some parts of the country, we represent BMO as far as banks are concerned. But we also 
you know, we represent 32 different mortgage lenders. So based on that, here's the answer. If you're incorporated or you're a sole proprietorship, we don't care. As long as you declare your income and you have tax returns to back up that income that you're declaring, why did you? Why would you go to an incorporation as opposed to a sole proprietorship? The number one reason is taxes. I know you're, things. Were you're going to be taxed sold. lower as an incorporated company because you're taking money out either a as an employee or, as a or b as a dividend. Yeah. Yeah. So there is a certain point where if you're making say 150 or over 150 thousand dollars, it's to your advantage to become incorporated. Mm. If you're making less than 150,000 claiming less than $150,000, it's probably best to be sole proprietor. That Th- number are changes simpler when I was when we were sole proprietor. I feel like mm. I don't know what I'm doing. Well, thinking. probably cuz you just have multiple accounts now too. Yeah, right? But so that's the, that's that's the, the clearest and simplest way yeah, to put okay. it, right? Okay, so as well, long as enough. so as long as the same amount of income is being declared, mm-hmm. what I'm hearing is it doesn't matter mm-hmm. whether you're incorporated or sole proprietor. As long as you're claiming your taxes. Now that's interesting. Okay, that's a little bit contrary to what I Me um, too. believed, but that could just be something yeah. you know. I you really hear something have my once. Tongue twisted there. So so here's <laughs> here's what we look for in sole proprietorship versus incorporated. Yep. We look for a history, right? We want to see two years history, your T1 tax returns, that's your tax return, um, your notice of assessment for two years. We probably want to see some background on how you're getting your money. Yeah. In other words, if you have an accountant, an accountant statement. Right. If you're incorporated, we need all of that, plus we need your corporate tax return yeah. because we can use your corporate tax return to actually increase your income because right. you might have appreciatory value in your company right so because there's you know, your income and then the company's income as well right so maybe two entities yeah so maybe you you know got computers and you've got you've got computers and lights and All cameras assets, and, maybe and that, building, that's an or... asset that we can actually use a portion of to increase your income okay good to know so so then that's on what is income let's talk about down payments for a minute yes so if somebody is looking to make a down payment let's start off on the residential home but let's Open the conversation up to putting down payments on duplex, triplex, and four and above pretty well commercials. So let's yeah. start off at the residential, putting down payments. Um, what can be, first of all, what can be considered a down payment? So Where down, can the down payment come from? Down payment can come from your RSP, from your first-time home buyer's plan. It can come from your savings account. Could be from the sale of an asset. If okay. you have a car in the backyard or a second car and you don't need it, and you sell that car and you have a receipt with the name of the person that bought it and the phone number of that person that bought it, and you can provide that, you dump that money into your bank account, that's your down payment. I guess that's do you a need broad that before? question. Do you need that before the pre-approval? Because the money has... No. Is, is that part of the pre-approval? No, but you intend to do this. But you intend to do this prior right. to the closing of the property? Yes. Okay. So usually 10 days, 15 days before a close. Car, bike, trike, side-by-side, boat, I have had clients sell playing cards on the internet. Playing cards. Playing cards. Oh, sports playing. cards and stuff, man. There was sports a ton. cards. <laughs> there uh, are some of them. Well, the right in, ones. Internet yeah. cards, yeah. magic cards. Pokemon they call them. cards. Yeah. I've had a client. <laughs> you got a, a Charizard. 20, put You're a twenty-five thousand dollar down payment from the sale of playing cards because he had all the receipts. What's What's the rule with crypto? Crypto is. Is Do you ever have clients that say, I got see, it in crypto? We need to see every sale and purchase and every receipt from every transaction on a crypto. Which Good normally luck. people are pulling in and out a lot and doing yeah. like day trading on there. It can be done, but it's super, super difficult. So, so just, that, that's cool, a pretty, cool. I guess, for more simpler terms, uh, the down payment aspect. I guess that's a pretty broad question and depending on what you're getting a down payment for is your second property third property or is it your first one right like no like down payment is down pull, payment though because you can pull the down payment out of a property to get another one if you want to refinance if you that want property. to refi that property right. but i think are you wondering brandon for a first house right don't forget no. or all in general 
No, yeah, I was I was opening the whole conversation okay. up to to, to talk about down payments from the perspective of your first home per se, or if you were Which selling is, your house and then putting a down payment on another one, and then actually going into the investment property aspect of it. Too. So five percent, right. right, is for your first home. Now, right. if I buy a second property, it's not going to be five, is it? Wrong. Okay. See, this, is, this is where I want to have the conversation. So right? I'm gonna I'm gonna finish up the down payment. Where the down payments come from? We yes, talked about it. Perfect. So you can get it from ca- not cash, but you can get it from your savings account. Get it from your TFSA. You can get it Save. from your RRSP. You can get have it as a gift from a family member. Right. Right. As a gift from a family member. It has letter. to be a gift, not a loan. No, not a loan, but a gift from a family member. The family member deposits the money into your bank account. Not a loan. We send a gift letter to the family member. They fill it out. They sign it. The client signs it, and that's the gifted down payment. Now, let's go back to the down payment portion. 5% for a single family home, that's mm-hmm. a minimum. Mm-hmm. Which is crazy. Because in the States, they do it cheaper yeah. in some spots. You can do friggin' 2 3% down in the States. But we no. have something they don't have in the States, which is you can do something called a flex down, which means if you have very little debt and you are buying a house, you can borrow money on your line of credit for your down payment. Yeah, oh, the, really? And yes. Then, so, okay. Wait, we have that? We have that. I well, didn't yeah, think, I've done I that didn't think you could. Okay. I've done that before. You've done that before. Yeah, right? you can use that. But and then what I did, I don't know if it's whatever. It depends on who's doing it. For, say you borrow thirty thousand to put down on the house. Then what I do is I just borrow the extra money on the mortgage to pay my line of credit off. Mm-hmm. Put it all under one tree. Yep, that, that's the way you want to do it. But you can you can borrow money from your existing line of credit. Mm-hmm. But we have to add that debt to your debt line. You right. So still, as long as you're, as you're, long as you still qualify, as long as your ratio is well, still good at that these, point. Yes. The, okay. This okay. is what all these like. We met people when we went to Vegas. There was one guy I met. No joke. He was like thirty million in debt from properties. He's like Evan. I don't have any money sitting in my bank. Yeah, it's nice if you have two, three, four hundred thousand, fifty thousand, whatever. It's nice to look at, mm. but it's not doing anything. So but he's he, cash flowing. It's from cash these flowing. He's rich. Though? He's got Lambo. He's got this and that. But he's all debt. He's cash flowing every month. But he's not showing and he keeps they just keep pulling line of credits out, using their line of credits and their equity to buy other properties. It's pretty and interesting. I think, and I think what you're kinda of talking about too is almost like the Grant Cardone method of like pretty well having most of your money tied up in real estate that's cash flowing. It's pretty wild how to you to pay can... off the debt so that you have more income coming in than your debt ratio kind of deal. So it's like you'll have a lot of Debt, let's say the $30 million of debt, but there's X amount of income that then balances this whole thing out and makes it worthwhile to service and have that debt. Is that yeah, what we're like, talking about? We could do a yeah. whole podcast just on, on just just on the best way to invest in multiple properties in Canada. Let's not get All waylaid right. by the U.S. Well, we got lots yeah. of time. Luckily, well, we got we a have... little bit of time here. I'm no, like, I mean, not today, but like, we'll be able to do this in the future, yeah. too. Yeah. That's yeah. a great episode. Because we up. have more. Stay tuned, everybody. We no, have that's, more. that's an interesting one. That's for investors and things because I, that's such a fun topic because yeah. like, I don't need, I had people like I, I tell me when I sold my one of my houses and I was like looking for um i'll just say this real quick looking for somewhere to rent while we were building this place and i went and looked at i was like no no no, i'm not paying somebody this i called the bank i was like listen there's a, a duplex down here i want to buy it it's basically a shithole so i went while i was selling my house pulled money out of my house bought this house borrowed forty thousand on the other house to do the renos fixed that one up borrowed money again <laughs> t- to do this one and it was just moving money around. And I was like, whatever, sold it all. And that's how, like, that's essentially, it just all worked out and was able to build the house. The biggest trend is that we found in southern New Brunswick is young couples looking for multi-unit so that they can move on to the next house. Yeah. So there is a growing, and I mean a growing part of our market that is looking for that first house in looking for their second house, looking for their third property. So yeah. there is a growing entrepreneurial spirit, spirit as okay. we talked about, looking for multiple units. So yes, that's something we could definitely spend a whole hour talking about. Yeah. The ins okay. and outs, the pluses and minuses. Should we talk about how much um, a deposit can be for those? Or do you want to skip over that right now and kind of move on to... 
Well, we're going back. We're going back to the purchase and sale agreement. In other words, the what the client needs to do. Yes. Okay. Okay. So we've already okay. talked a little bit about, and we did talk about five percent as a minimum down payment yes. for a single family house. So I think we, we kind of have to today. stay in that stay in that lane because <clears throat> if we get into duplexes again, five percent. But once it's a triplex or a quad, then so it's a, a duplex ten, can be five, five, even if it's your second now, property. Even if it's your second property, you as long as you're duplex? planning on living on it, you have to plan on living. You have in to there. live in it. Yes. Right. 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 So you need to be the under the gen owner. under the second home program. You have to live in that property. So if you don't live in it, it's twenty percent. Yeah. For everybody, every any lender. investment property is twenty percent. Why? Because you're not living in it, and them's what the rules. The, right. Them's what the, the what what does that have to do with any of living in it or don't live in it or have a cat there? Who cares? Right. Why does that matter? Because if you're making a, money, everybody else wants a piece of it. It just doesn't make sense, <laughs> though, does it? It doesn't make sense. Why twenty? You don't know. I have no idea. It's so bizarre. I'm sure, no Brad idea. made the rules. He'd be able to. He'd, he'd, so would, let so me I, ask you this. Okay, say I put twenty percent down on a second property, and we're like, okay, Brad, here's what we're gonna do. I'm going to put 20% down. I'm going to buy this place. We're going to leave it open. And once it closes, then I'm going to remortgage it. And we're going to lock it in. I'm going to pull my money back out. Can you do that? Lenders will have a real hard time with why are you switching? Why are you flipping it so quickly? No, 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 no. You're taking money I want to keep it. it. Yeah. What I would say is say, I, we're going to do this. I'm going to leave it as an open mortgage, whatever, until yeah. it closes. Okay. After it closes, I'm going to bring an appraiser in. I might do a thing or two to it. And then I want my money back my 15 extra percent that I put into it then we're going to lock it in for five years after I get my equity out to get my money back is that that's an interesting scenario it's possible yeah it's possible I'd have to look at all that one you know what I mean there's a like lot say, of a lot of putting, you need 20 percent down it's eighty thousand dollars but yes you, yeah. but I'm like I don't I, I, I don't want, want this cash flow up. I don't want to tie it on so here's say Brad don't lock this mortgage and we'll leave it open after it closes, I'm going to bring the appraiser in and see if we can get this thing appraised for more. Maybe I have to put a new bathroom in it, whatever. But I want at least $70,000 back. Well, would, then we're going to lock it in for five years. Is that I would, possible? I would say that you're not in control of that in regards to the appraiser part of it. Right. No, no, no. I, I just, would say that the, if you if you got it as an open and then you decided to transfer it or switch it over to another bank or refinance it to another bank, then the bank would probably call for an appraisal. Yeah. And, and then, and yes, then. it is possible to go from an open to another to get money back yeah yeah i mean if you if you believe that the property has been improved in value right right if the property is worth more than you originally paid for it you opened it up as an an open again it's it depends if the under underwriters will you know yeah. buy into it but it makes more sense if you are improving the property and i think that's what people do right to get their equity i think they back. do it but they like do in, it over a longer a period like of time burr, like yeah. the burr i'm like Method i want to buy talking about buy refurbish refinance is that yes what, is that kind of what you're thinking and like because people like use heard yeah, that oh, yeah. Yeah. Again, like if you wanted to use that what i'm saying is if you bought a property with your line of credit and you wanted that money back somehow if it to pay it off right we're getting into investments again okay so. <laughs> <laughs> So this, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring it back. So the this client, is the ADHD yeah, yeah. of Brandon and Evan Young's podcast. Yeah. Squirrel, just, <laughs> squirrel. Yeah. Um, so client, we've we've done the pre-approval. We've gotten yep. the information. We've gotten their income documents. We've gotten yep. their credit check pulled. Yes. We we quickly we underwrite the uh, the um, file. We then contact the realtor and say underwrite the file. Can we touch words, on that real we quick? We look at everything that the underwriter looks at. We pre-underwrite it. Let's just explain what the underwriter is to everybody, because that's a strange term. I think that most people don't understand. And I, I think even us in real estate, like I, yeah. I've never seen this underwriter. I've never he's, seen what one looks like. He's like the Undertaker. It's, in the it's like a mythical creature. I picture, I picture the <laughs> underwriters. Cape. Sometimes I, I picture wonder. a bunch of people in suits in a smoky cigar room <laughs> with briefcases that they open up once a week, and they no, all and they all go him. right, right, and they go hmm, yes, no, yes, no, yes. yes. And it's crazy no, no, <laughs> and it depends on these guys too. They have relationships with some of these. Right, under it is Underwriter Appreciation Week, by the way. Oh, uh, is it Underwriter Appreciation it, yeah, Week? So. Well, wicked. There you go. I would love to meet some of these underwriters. Bring them a box of cigars. I would love to meet them. <laughs> so, if there's any I'm, underwriters out there, would love to have you on. We anticipate what the bank's underwriters are going to look at in the application to make sure it meets all of the criteria of the Lending Act. So that's what an underwriter does. We have to tick off all of the boxes. If there's any red flags on the deal, 
we're going to pick them up first before the underwriter picks it up at the bank. So you're explaining what you do, but the underwriter, so they oversee the file that you put they together, the proposal. So pretty well, the way that I see it is you will put a proposal together that you then send to the underwriter. So you're making the most favorable file in the most favorable case possible for the client saying here's the reason that they should be approved right they've met this criteria this criteria this criteria and we also have a, a storyline which we also we expound very well on about you know joe had a bit of a problem when he was out west and he may have missed some payments but then he broke his leg and then he had to be hospitalized like all of that background right and all that matters and that's what i'm trying to i guess yeah it does make matter. important here and make known is is that there is that it it doesn't just start and stop with you approving it, that there's an underwriter involved in the story and the way that you present the file to the underwriter matters, which is why it really matters who you pick to help get you the mortgage because you want to pick somebody that's going to make a favorable um, story and scenario and know how to work the underwriter because that's a whole other aspect of getting a mortgage that I think most people don't even know about. Right, and the underwriters really they are there. The, they can kill it. They're the ones who's making the final say, basically. Well, right. it could be them, and it could be the insurer, whether it's CMHC or Sajin or Canada Guarantee. If it's you're putting five percent down, remember the underwriter at the bank has got to, or at the lender has got to approve it. Then they take it to the insurer, and the insurer has the final say. So when's this? Not, so it all happens the same. It all happens so within four hours. So the underwriter and the CMHC both look at it. Yes. Well, the underwriter sees it, then they move so it to the. So they kind of double check everything. So the underwriter basically say, is trying to confirm everything that I've said, right? And if they agree with it, that's great. The bank has approved it. They take it to the insurer. Then the insurer at that the point. Insurer okay. does, the insurer, because they are you know, monitoring, they're the overseers of all insured mortgages in and the in country. And in this case, it's CMHC pretty well, has the monopoly there, right? Well, CMHC, Sajin, and Canada Guarantee. They're three different okay. companies. Two of them are private, one of them is then. government. Okay. But okay. It, they all they all answer to the same, you know, they all answer to the same overlord of the federal government. So okay. at the end of the day, overlord. they're the one. They're the ones that have to be uh, culpable for any audits. So yes, absolutely. We underwrite the file, uh, or we pre-underwrite the file and give a letter of pre-approval to you, the realtor. That tells the realtor, hey, listen, um, this client is good to go. It gives you the confidence that your client is ready to go. They have the down payment. They've met all the criteria. You include it in the purchase and sale when you make an offer on a house. That gives the seller of the house confidence that your client hundred percent especially in this to market today yeah. right that's one thing so so <clears throat> basically before anyone looks at a property call your bank or broker or whoever you're working with to get all your ducks in a row mm -hmm. and then you could start shopping because a lot of people i feel like oh, over the years of doing this a lot of people go online and do this pre-approval oh i'm proof for 500 but no you're That's not the really you might yeah. be approved only for three so you're only doing yourself a favor because you could be setting um, high expectations yeah. for yourself and letting yourself down so if, if you talk to brad or whoever's doing yeah. it first you know what you can get and what you can't get and right. then everything's done and in the competitive market like we have today here in new brunswick when that's all, all your ducks are in a row, we can get things done in like five days. We can tell less. the client right. what their budget is. We can tell the client what it looks like. What you know, property taxes play a big part of debt too. So we look at the, we break it down: property tax and mortgage. We tell the client, "Hey, you are good to this point. Yeah, this is what your basic maximum budget is." I will tell you that if you go online, ninety nine point nine percent of those online websites that say you're pre approved. It's bullshit. One hundred percent. It's yeah. not. It's not pre-approved. You're pre-qualified. What right. that means is, your income. You're stating your debt. the The algorithm says, "Yep, you're qualified for this amount of money." But yeah. It doesn't take into effect that you might be paying alimony, child support. You might have a lien on your house. You might have a lien on your truck. You might have all of these little caveats. That's that, not that, land that, taxes. And it's, and it's only insurance. as accurate as your being to the system, too, right? Yeah. So a lot of people probably fudge it a little bit like oh i make x amount of dollars and it's not the exact like everybody plays their situation up right. a little bit when they don't have to show proof pre-qualified is not pre-approved pre-qualified <laughs> right. is not pre-approved that's right. all I, I will tell anybody exactly no it's yep. true i'm glad we touched on that so it's yep. pr pretty simple really if you're looking to buy a house go to the bank or broker or whoever um brad is available taking applications <laughs> uh, but seriously though t 
to go. You got to go talk to go to your bank, your broker. Go to your bank, your broker, your your credit union. You know, get the pre approval. Get, get the pre approval done. Get it absolutely, done. absolutely. So because I actually it, won't it, take anyone out until they do that now. And, and well, exactly. I, I just, I just won't. No offense to anybody, but like, I'll go I, meet them the first time. And then first if they haven't time, done it, they have to do that, right? Yes. Get the questions and help them because some people just don't know where to go or what to do or who would be the best it, fit for them. Yeah. And it's and it's less even about us and it's more about the client's time too. So if you're not going to go and get pre-approved, you're actually they're wasting their own time because if they find a property, they get all excited, they put an offer in and find out that they don't actually have the finances to be able to you to can't even compete now. to get financing on this property, then everything was a waste of time. It's a huge uh burden on your emotions and it's just not good for anybody so right. you so. say that so sometimes it takes like what what you need brad for a pre-approval you need a lot of documents t4s any any there's a lot of stuff a bank needs to get the pre-approval done and sometimes that can take people three four or five days around all this stuff up Absolutely. so if you're going to look at a house and you uh, want a realtor to write an offer on it for you you need to be ready you're not even going to stand a chance in this market because you gonna have to put two weeks for conditions, yeah. right? right? Exactly. So when you make your offer to the seller and say you get approved, now the <laughs> clock starts ticking. Yes. You've got five oh, days, yeah. six days, ten days to get your financing together, meaning we've got to send the application to the lender and get approved. And then once we have an approval, and because we have all your documents, we'll send a letter of finance out to your to your realtor, and everybody knows that it's done. You've got that same amount of time to get your minimum 5% deposit to your realtor mm -hmm. or to your realtor's lawyer or to the seller's realtor. Right. So at, you've got the clock starts ticking. So if you've got five days to finance or 10 days to tests, finance. Yeah. All your conditions on there. Right. So yeah. let's talk a little bit about that. So yes. there's always conditions on the, on the purchase and sale agreement. Water mm -hmm. test. Um, maybe inspections, maybe inspections, insurance, if there's any work that needs to be mm -hmm. done prior and, to firming the deal up. And we say firm, meaning that the deposit has been given and all conditions have been met. Right. Yeah. So in the past, we've always had to kind of chase realtors for things like water test, insurance, that kind of thing. As of last year or most recently, most lenders are asking for us to ask to make sure that once the conditions are met, we get a waiver of conditions. Okay, is that what they're asking for now? Yeah, they're asking for waiver conditions. That like a way, fulfillment. Because I, yeah, fulfillment, yeah, fulfillment, asked, fulfillment of conditions. That, that way, form, yeah. we're not chasing, and the lawyer at the end of the deal is not chasing for all these little things. So once we have a fulfillment of conditions, that means water's kind of past the deal. You know, got the insurance in place. Blah blah blah. Inspection. Yep. Right. So you've got that period to get your deposit in. You've got to get your financing done. You got to get your inspection and water test and all that. That time. Once that's done. The majority of the work is done. Yeah. And now, a lot of this, I find the, like, one of the things that takes the longest for most deals is the financing mm -hmm. is, is your part. And it's either people don't have their ducks in a row or they're working with a bank that's slow, or it seems like everything happens at the <laughs> 11th hour. You, it seems like it always happens at the 11th hour, but I've, I've heard and, and done deals with you before where it's quick, where mm -hmm. it's quicker. But it's also through, you we just talked about this a couple of days ago. You need to be surrounded by the right people, like professionally wise, yep. the right realtor, the right uh, bank or broker. You need to be surrounded by the right people. When the offer is accepted for me, I'm like, let's go. If something goes wrong, something goes wrong. If a water test doesn't pass mm -hmm. and your conditions are only five days, like shock the well and move on. No yeah, big yeah. deal. You we just we just signed test. an amendment that the water will be. Fix by closing, no big deal. But if you're around the wrong people, like, like if you have one realtor and one realtor and one's always trying to butt heads with another, they can, honest to God, wreck a deal over a water test or something so ridiculous instead would, of working together. I right? would say it all starts with the realtor. If 100%. I if I have realtor number A, say the realtor number A is Evan, and he comes to me with a client. He says a client is looking to buy a house. I'm on the on the phone with that client within an hour. I, that client within that hour knows what documents they have to have to <clears> us <throat> within 24 hours or as soon as they possibly can. Mm -hmm. There are initial documents we need right away. We can get the rest of the documents later. Letter okay. of employment, we get that later. Yeah, yeah. You know, if you tell me you don't owe the tax man money, well, we can get that notice of assessment later as long as you tell me the truth. Right. So we can get that pre-application done the same day, right? So it starts with the realtor. If you have realtor B who says, I have a client, 
and here's their phone number and we try to get a hold of them and say the, the, the realtor's not done their homework with the client or doesn't, hasn't got an established a relationship with the client. Now the client takes a week, two weeks, three weeks to get their documents to us, but yet they've gone out and they've put an offer on a property because the realtor didn't tell was, them, you gotta yeah. have your documents up front, you gotta get your financing in place. Yep. That's That can be a nightmare. And not only that, actually you can lose, um, It's if you don't do your homework, and in today, if I have, say I have 10 offers on a property and somebody's telling me, oh, yeah, my guy's good, my guy's good. I'm taking your word for it, Brandon, yep. because I trust you. You're professional. You know what you're doing. And then you call me in six days or, and, and oh, sorry, uh, yeah, I didn't good. I'm like, Could man, get financing. what do you mean? You yeah. swore to me that everything was good. And it's going to make you second guess that next, next time. time. Absolutely. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. even the relationship and, and, and the reputation matters significantly as well when yeah. doing business. And I mean, not that it should. And that's with everybody. Shouldn't. That's not just but, real I mean, things, but it's But it's, yeah, exactly. That's just yeah. a life thing, right? So it's like the better the reputation um, and the more you're known for, let's say, qualifying the clients. Then like, the Brad, better you that's know you gonna, call Brad, you're getting it done. Then the better that's going to be Whether it's a no or yes, you're getting term, it done. Right? Yeah. You're, in this industry, we all are only as good as our last deal. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. Right. I think that's a good way to bring it back around and wrap things up, eh? Yep. That was a really good chat. I enjoyed Did that. Did we make it to the end? Did we? Of the buying process? Pretty well. I mean, we're close. So Once we're... you've met your conditions, you're yeah. going to the lawyer. Oh, yes. The lawyer's going to close about a week before the house closes. You're going to meet your lawyer. Yes. He's Let's going to do all the up. accounting. Oh, yes. He's going to do all the legal work. We can, have a, we can have another discussion about the ins and outs of closing costs, and maybe we'll bring a lawyer in to talk about it. Yeah, that'd, that'd be cool. cool. Let's bring that'd Fred really over. Good. We'll bring Fred over, and we'll, yeah. we'll chat. But on the lawyer, so um, I just had to chat with somebody yesterday. I don't. So we, if you guys have a lawyer or any clients have a lawyer, um, that's great. Just give us a name. But if not, uh, we can find one for you and you don't need to do anything. We get everything sent to the lawyer for you. So you yes. literally just show up. So yep. that's something people think of a lawyer and they get a little bit scared. eh? like, what do I need a lawyer for? And this, no, 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 no. You need it to, to get the property into your name and a few other things. But we look after all of that and sending all the paperwork from the mortgage stuff yep. to the everything. We get everything sent to the lawyer. So the, your realtor or your broker can actually suggest three different lawyers. Right. But the point is that the lawyer needs to be advised before the file is coming to them that they're representing the client. Of course. So they need time to prepare the instructions to yeah. get it done. Yeah. So stay tuned And then tuned the mortgage instructions then get sent to the lawyer. Yes. And that instructs them how to process everything so that the title search and all of that stuff happens. And the province gets their land title, gets their land tax, and they get their the one percent. Crazy. One dollar on every thousand, right? Or, oh, I think it's a percent. Or, so it's it yeah. works out to a dollar on every thousand. Like if a property's two hundred fifty thousand, it's twenty five hundred bucks for land transfer. So tax. What I tell clients is this: it's going to be different depending on who lawyer, who you have as your lawyer. Some lawyers are more expensive than others, but at the end of the day, the lawyer I, fees. Yeah. I always say minimum down payment is five percent. Expect that your closing costs will be somewhere between two point five yeah. and three percent of the purchase price. Yeah, it's yeah. true. Those yeah. land the land transfer tax. And that's is it. So, so is, does well, every province land... do that? Yes, and it's a different amount. Because 1% of that is the land transfer tax. 1% right off the bat. 1% of yes. the land transfer tax, you've got to pay your property taxes for the rest of the year because your sellers yes. already paid their property taxes. So you've got to reimburse them that. You've got to put land transfer tax. Right. You've got the AFR registration. So there are... And the, 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 time to buy. And that's before your lawyer fees, right? And that's then you've got your cost of your lawyer, admin, right. and HST. Yeah. Right. The best time to actually buy a property is probably like November because you're not paying that much in taxes. Depending if you are paying your own taxes the following year or depending if you have the bank picking up your taxes. Right. Because if the bank picks up your taxes in November, and here we're going down the rabbit hole here, kids. But <laughs> Hang but, on. But, Hang but, on. But if, if you buy a house in November and you only have to pay back uh, the seller for one month, that's yeah. great. Yeah. But if your bank is taking your property taxes towards 2025's taxes, they're going to ask you for two-thirds of next year's taxes up front and they're going to ask the lawyer to collect that. And then the next month, they're going to grab a couple, uh, a month's worth of property taxes. But then is that a credit for you coming yes. into that year, though? Because yeah. then you don't need to pay that? Or well, it, your property taxes are due in June. So that lender has a property tax account that they've taken two-thirds from you at closing. Yeah. 
So it's an additional two thirds to your two and a half or three percent. Right. Plus every month they're taking out a month's payment to put into that property tax account. It has to be whole by June first. Eight percent basically is what you need to buy a house. Eight percent saved up. Depending or on the time of the year. Of money. If it's if it's if it's Seven, first, eight. if it's the first quarter of the year, I always say eight percent. If it's halfway through the year, it's about three uh, two and seven two point seven five percent. And if it's in the last quarter of the year, it's about two and a half percent. That's the average. It went you from eight percent to two no, and a no, half. No, 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 no. No, no. I'm talking about the three, the closing costs. So closing yeah. costs. Yeah, closing yeah. costs can range between two and a half and three percent, depending right. on the time of the year. Two that, and a half and three percent. Okay. Depending on the time of the year that you, you buy. Seven to eight percent, and you'll you'll be good. Yeah. yeah. Expect to spend that. Yeah. Exactly, and then yeah. you'll be happily surprised when you have money left over. But exactly. Yeah. Stay tuned because we're going to do that. We're going to set that up. We're going to bring a lawyer on, um, and we'll really get because a lot of people want to know exactly where the money's going what it does so let's bring on a lawyer because this is what the people are going to want so we're going to give <laughs> what the people want <laughs> all right we'll have to open up our wallets to get a lawyer on here no 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 i'm just joking yeah, i'll pay him i'll yeah. pay him all right there I'll we go him. yeah all right no we're gonna do that we'll do that we have sweet a yeah, so then that uh, that kind of wraps it up in a bow. So I'm hoping now, after this conversation, um, for those that are still watching, we'll have a much better idea on the entire process from going to get pre-approved to then closing the deal. So that's pretty yeah. well what we just covered and tied we, up with a bow here. I yeah. think so, we broke and it down then, pretty good. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I mean, we had a couple really Side good tracks. tangents that were, that were much needed. And then I think there's a, probably a whole other episode on investing that we could talk about. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. A lot of people are in investing. I think that would, uh, there's a lot of people looking to invest in New Brunswick. Um, so that would be yeah. a good one. And like to talk you said, about. a lot more people have that entrepreneurial spirit and are kind of looking at that as an avenue. And I think it's also because the internet makes it much easier and explains everything easier now. Yeah. For people, there's much more, ex you know, information. Anyway, let's anyway. wrap this up. <laughs> Brad, thank you it so, so pleasure. much. That was really good. Thanks, guys. And um, yeah. Till next time. Awesome. See you.